So good morning. Um, we're happy to be here with uh, some of you again, because some of you have uh, taken advantage of this wonderful series that HSU is hosting with our master gardeners here in Humboldt and Dale North counties. Uh, my name is Maria Krennic and I am a master gardener. And today we are going to talk to you about success with house plants. Our speaker is Sherida Phipps, and she is a master gardener, as well as our wonderful coordinator for our Del Norte and Humboldt County group. Um, she moved here to Humboldt uh, just recently from the Central Valley, and gardening has been a passion for her all these uh, many years. Now, uh, as we've done before, if you could, uh, hold your questions off till the end of the session. You are certainly uh, welcome to write them into your chat, ch uh, your chat room uh, zone area so that we can collect them and try to answer as many as we possibly can at the end of the session. But before we go on to Sherida, let me uh, talk to you a little bit about our uh, Master Gardener group. The Master Gardener are trained and certified through the University of California Cooperative Extension. Um, it is uh, designated county by county, and in our case, uh, Del Norte and Humboldt County are combined. We do go through extensive training that involves um, a, some book learning, some on hands learning, and uh, we are taught by horticultural academics and advisors, entomologists and specialized educators that give us up-to-date knowledge and continue to uh, be available to us to help us out. Our initial uh, certification training um, occurs and then we commit to uh, continued education um, over uh, each year with many uh, updates and, and uh, considerations. The Master Gardeners are volunteers. We extend our educational services to the general community and are available through our website. All that information um, will be available to you at the end of the uh, session. And uh, we will also communicate that information by email later on uh, after the program is over. Um, through outreach and lectures, our goal is to help you with healthier plants, healthier environments, healthier gardeners um, make for uh, healthier communities. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, introduce our wonderful speaker, Sherida, and she will talk to us about houseplants. So Sherida, welcome. Thanks. Hello. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to HSU for inviting us to speak today. Um, I'm excited to be here. And, um, and um, we all love houseplants and there's many benefits of indoor plants. Now interior plants, they're an ideal way to create attractive and restful settings. And it enhances our sense of well-being as well. And for some of us, it can be a satisfying hobby. Um, they not only enhance our interiors, they also help purify the air in our homes. Indoor plants not only convert carbon dioxide to oxygen, but they also trap and they absorb many pollutants. This is called off-gassing. And those are chemical compounds that are released into the air. And they come from everyday items which are present in our homes and our offices. So today we're going to be going to share with you what to do to have happy houseplants. I'm sure most of us have brought home plants just to slowly watch them uh, wither away. To be successful with growing houseplants, we need to understand how our interior environments affect plant growth and how it differs from growing plants outdoors. Today, we will speak about plant growth and health and how it's affected by the light, temperature, humidity, water, nutrition, and soil. And we're also gonna discuss selecting containers, grooming, training, and pest management. So of all the major factors affecting plant growth, 
adequate light is the most important and the amount of light in a given location inside your home, it's always changing. It's affected by the presence of outdoor trees, uh, roof overhangs, interior wall color, and which is reflecting the light uh, off the walls, the window coverings, the day length, the time of day, and of course the time of year. And adequate light is needed for plants to produce food and to survive. We can uh, measure light by using a light meter app for our smartphones. Who would, who would think of that? Yes, there's also apps for measuring our candle foot of lights. Um, there's many free apps available. Uh, just search with the phrase light meter measure foot candles and um, you'll pull up several different apps to choose from. Now during uh, daylight, at various times of the day, I'll take my phone and a notepad to the location of where I want to place my plant and I jot down the readings. Then when shopping for indoor plants, either by looking at the Sunset Garden book or um, going to the nursery, I know what plant I want to be searching for because I know what location I want to put it in. Now the plant's labels will usually indicate the plant's light requirement. And um, let's look at this chart to get an idea of what the lighting would be. So when um, measuring uh, with a, a, um, a meter, uh, readings of 25 to 75 would be a low uh, light requirement. Medium is 75 to 200. Um, greater than 200 is high with no sun. And then you might find some uh, light requirements that say sunny location. So that means that it, that location needs to get at least four hours of direct sunlight a day. Now seasons, they change the amount of natural light entering through windows. And this diagram, it shows that the summer sun's higher than that of the winter sun and the winter light, it penetrates farther into a room than the summer light. Uh, windows with eastern exposures, they generally produce the best light and temperature conditions for most indoor plant growth because the plant, it receives direct morning light from sunrise until nearly midday. And also the Eastern room, it's cooler than the Southern or the Western rooms because the house absorbs less radiant heat. Now windows with Southern exposures, they give the largest variation of light and temperature conditions and are interchangeable for most plants. And windows with Northern exposure provide the least amount of light and the lowest temperature. And out of all of the four exposure, the northern exposure receives the least light and heat year round. And because of the low light levels maintaining healthy plants, it can be challenging. Um, a northern window sill, and that would be right at the window, uh, can measure light levels as low as 200 foot candles on a clear winter day, uh, which for some plants is optimal for them. Now, how can we tell if our plant's not receiving adequate light? Well, all we have to do is listen, and they're going to tell us. And so what are these indications? Well, it could be that the plant doesn't grow. Um, they may be reaching for the light, and that's shown by the inner nodes, which are the spaces between the leaves. Um, in this case, the inner nodes on the new growth are much longer than the inner nodes on the older part of the plant. And the new leaves, they might be smaller and perhaps a little lighter green, and the older leaves will start to die. Uh, the plants with variegated leaves will lose their variegation. So, you know, as with everything, of course, you know, keep in mind that some of these symptoms might also be an indication of other issues as well. Now temperature is the second most important factor. Um, generally, we feel comfortable in the range of 72 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. 
since most plants, um, indoor plants, originated from the tropical and subtropical areas of the world, where they grow in the ranges of um, 58 to 86 degrees. Um, the best temperature range for indoor plants is 70 to 80 during the day with a drop to 65 to 70 at night. Also keep in mind that not all interior plants have the same temperature requirements for their optimal growth. Now let's discuss water. The most important plant care skill is learning how to water correctly. And that's both for our interior plants and our landscape plants. Applying too much water, that can suffocate plant roots. And too little of water causes growth to become erratic and stunted. Now keep in mind that not all plants are similar in their water requirements. So just like the light, you want to check the plant label which will generally indicate their uh, water requirements as well. Now, watering frequency, it depends on the conditions under which the plants are growing. Uh, for instance, if the growing container is too small, watering may be required more frequently, and the amount of water already present in the growing medium will also affect your watering frequency by how quickly it dries out. Uh, plants under high light, they're going to transpire more water compared with plants under low light conditions. Improper watering can cause many problems and containers with saucers may cause an excessive buildup of soluble salts. High levels of soluble salts can cause damage to plant roots and a decline in growth. We're going to be discussing more about soluble salts in a couple of more slides. So always discard any water that's drained in the saucer after you water it. We always hear, when do you water? How often do you water? Well, our answer is always when the top one inch of the soil becomes dry. You want to feel the soil by inserting a finger an inch or so belong, below the surface. And um, if the soil is still moist, no further water is needed at that time. Now, the quality of the irrigation water is an issue with some plants that are susceptible to fluorine and chlorine, such as your corn plants, your Thai plants, your peacock plants, and rattlesnake plants. Uh, in general, plants with long linear leaves, such as spider plants, they're more susceptible to fluorine damage as well. And for this reason, you don't want to use these plants around your pools. Um, if your city water is treated and you see this type of burning that you see in the pictures here on the leaf margins, um, you can alleviate this problem by letting the water stand for several days before watering. And by doing this, some of that chlorine and fluorine, it's going to dissipate. Also, you don't want to use softened water as most water softening systems use salt. And be careful with reclaimed water, as it can also be an issue uh, depending on its source and what chemicals it contains. Distilled water is another uh, water that you don't want to use because it will pull minerals out of the soil. When I water, I always use room temperature water for my indoor plants because I don't want to shock their roots. In a previous slide, I mentioned soluble salts. So what are they? Well, fertilizers are salts that contain various plant nutrients and excessive soluble salts. They can accumulate in the soil when ex excess fertilizer is used or when fertilizer is applied too frequently without sufficient water to leach the fertilizer through the soil. High levels of soluble salts can cause damage to the plant roots and a decline in the growth. Now, as we see in the top picture of the fern, um, we can see uh, some salt burn um, on the leaf and tip margins. Uh, the bottom picture is soluble salt damage um, to, and it's burned the roots. Now, notice that the healthy roots, they're white, um, while the dead roots are brown. Um, 
and also dead roots. They invite root disease. So don't allow your plants um, to um, sit in um, saucers uh, filled with water. Make sure that you have a proper drainage for those plants and to avoid salt buildup, leach the soil occasionally and allow the water to drain frequently from the pot. Now, one of the most often looked criteria or overlooked criteria is relative humidity. And um, relative humidity, it's the amount of moisture contained in the air. And as we've already learned, most of our indoor plants, they come from the tropics where there is high hum uh, humidity. Uh, we can take some steps to help our plants adjust to low relative humidity in our homes. For instance, we can place our plants close together to create a microenvironment with a higher um, relative humidity. Uh, we can use a shallow container filled with water and lava rocks or gravel, uh, which will provide evaporation from a large surface area and it'll increase the relative humidity. We can use a humidifier um, and some of us like to use mist bottles to spray around the plant. However, in reality, you would need to mist every few minutes for an indefinite amount of time to make a real difference in the humidity around the plants. The foliage and plants and of plants with hairy leaves, um, they shouldn't be sprayed with water. Uh, water on these plants may stay longer and it provides opportunities for disease spores to germinate. Well, let's go on to feeding our plants. <clears throat> when we uh, over fertilize, the water in the soil becomes so salty that it burns. It burns the plant roots by removing water from them. And as we discussed earlier, excessive um, soluble salts accumulates. And it's shown as a whitish crust on the surface of the crown, uh, the growing medium, or near the rim of the container. Um, so before feeding plants, we want to consider these facts. We want to make sure that the plants um, that are heavy feeder, feeders, they're getting a more frequent um, uh, fertilizer. And, and some need little or no additional fertilizer for months. Smaller pots, they require less fertilizer compared with larger pots because they contain less soil. And um, the higher the light levels, the more nutrients are needed for plant growth. A newly, newly purchased healthy plant, it rarely needs an immediate application of fertilizer because in most cases, the amount of fertilizer applied to the commercial growers will supply enough nutrients for probably two or three months in the home. As a starting point, use about one fourth the label rate for monthly applications uh, during the winter when the light levels are low, a plant's need for fertilizers reduced because it's not actively growing. During the spring and summer, when the light levels increase and the plant's actively growing, it needs more fertilizer. So if the overall plant color becomes lighter green, then feed it every two weeks. If the new growth is dark green and leaves are small and the inner nodes seem longer than that on the older growth, we will want to decrease the fertilizer rate. Now keep in mind that this rule is flexible. Um, if there's deficiency symptoms are evident, um, you wanna fertilize application uh, more frequently. The secret to fertilizing indoor plants is to apply small amount of fertilizer as the plant grows. Without new growth, remember the plant has a limited need for more fertilizer. And many fertilizers, they come in specialized um, designed formulas for indoor plants and also for various plant varieties. Now moving on to potting. If the plant has been growing well, it will likely need repotting at some time. The decision to repot should be based on the plant's appearance. Is it top heavy? Is it 
filling the container with new shoots? Is there extensive root growth out of the pot's drainage holes? Well, these, these are all indications that it's time to repot our plant. So what size of container should we use? Well, planting in too large a container will give the roots more soil than they initially need. And the excess soil will hold extra moisture. It creates overly wet conditions, which will invite problems. You want to increase your pot size through small increments rather than doubling the pot size in one step. And if you're reusing containers, make sure that they're clean. Wash them out. Wash out the old soil, the compost, chemicals, paint residues, whatever. And you want to sterilize that container by placing it in a 10% bleach solution. And then you want to rin rinse it well before you use it. Now the style, shape, and size of containers, they should complement the plant and your decor. Generally, select pots which are going to provide the proper drainage. Tear, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, containers can be made from a wide range of materials. Terracotta, clay, plastic, fiberglass, ceramic. Uh, terracotta pots made of fire clay are some of the most popular choices. Now plants perform very well in terracotta pots because they are porous, which allows good air exchange between the plant roots and the environment. And clay pots, they can be glazed or unglazed. And the glazed pots, they restrict air exchange, but offer more design choices. And the unglazed pots, uh, they evaporate water faster and plants in them may need more frequent watering. Now the disadvantage of clay containers, including their weight, especially if they're the larger ones, there's the chance that they're going to chip or break. Fiberglass and plastic pots, they have the advantage of being lightweight as well as chip and break resistant. However, um, the air exchange and the water evaporation rates are generally lower in plastic containers compared with clay pots. Uh, plant, plants uh, placed in plastic pots, they're, they're not gonna dry out as quickly as those in the clay pots and um, that can increase the danger of overwatering. Now the growing medium, it provides anchorage water, it provides minerals. And when repotting plants, make sure that the new mix is well drained, it's aerated, um, that it holds water and nutrients well, and it's within the right pH range, which is about 5 to 6.5. Now a good potting mix will provide ample amount of oxygen to the root system. Most professional mixes are good to use, however, there's no standard requirements, and they are very inconsistent. And please, please do not use soil from your ground. It's too heavy for our container plants. Some plants, they require special mixes, uh, for exam example, bromeliads, uh, orchids, African violets, and succulents. Uh, you can either purchase these mixes or you can prepare them on your own on these. So when's the best time to prune? When the knife is sharp, goes the old saying, and uh, use the natural life cycle as a guide. For example, when the plant's growing rapidly and you want to maintain a certain size, you want to prune it lightly and frequently. You can remove shoots or the shoot tips when they're small. And um, when removing the very immature tips, uh, that practice is called pinching. And uh, pinching and light pruning, it also increases branching of the stems and it results in a denser and fuller plant. And when the plant has outgrown its container and you wanna keep that plant in the same container, that might be the time to do some root pruning, uh, pruning. So we do this by carefully removing the plant from the container and we pull back the roots from the uh, root mass and uh, we cut them back to within one inch of the soil. 
Um, an alternative method is to make three to four vertical cuts one inch deep into the soil ball. A clean plant is a healthy plant, so we groom our plants. I groom my plants every time I water. I remove the dust on the leaves because the dust dulls the leaves and it also shades the plant surface and it interferes with its intake of light. And dust on the lower leaf surface may clog the stomata. And that's the specialized cells involved in water transpiration. It inhibits gas exchange within the leaves. Now leaves with thick shiny cuticles uh, such as the, your crotons and your ficus, your pisilis and bromeliads, they, um, they should be cleaned with a damp sponge. If the plant's small, uh, you can dip the foliage in tepid water and you can swirl it around. Uh, keep in mind, you shouldn't be using water um, when cleaning um, leaves that are have hairy leaves. Um, instead, you can use a small paint paintbrush uh, to remove the leaves. And that's what I do for my African violets. I water my plants and um, then I uh, take my little soft uh, paintbrush and I brush off my leaves. So always remove your dead flowers and your leaves frequently. Um, also a little uh, tip that I'd like to provide you um, is a florist practice. Uh, when they sell plants, they trim the leaves uh, that have any um, tip or marginal uh, necrosis. And um, necrosis is the browning of the leaf edge. Uh, they trim the leaves in the natural shape of that leaf. Now, few plants, they stay pest free forever. Um, pest insects are more likely to be encountered on indoor plants than diseases when we care for our plants correctly. Um, so when we care for our plants correctly, uh, the environment rarely offers favorable conditions for foliar disease to develop. But however, when plants are grown under stressful conditions such as low light, excessive water, we can get some soil borne uh, pathogens develop. So what do we do for um, our plant problems? Well, the best method is prevention and we wanna purchase pest-free plants. We wanna isolate that plant for a few days to make sure we don't bring home hitchhikers or a diseased plant. When we find a pest, we'll wanna isolate that plant um, as we don't want to infect our other plants. Now, if an indoor uh, conditions permit, or uh, if outdoor conditions permit, you can take that affected uh, house plant outside in a protected area um, and you can let natural predators um, to come by and rid the plant of the pest. Um, we may decide to discard these plants and but please don't place them in your compost piles and don't by no means bring beneficial insects indoors. They may work great in your greenhouse with a large number of plants and pests, but there isn't just enough food in your home to sustain their population. And most pets, they can be controlled uh, culturally on indoor plants without any use of chemicals. Now let's meet a few of these pesty pets. We're all familiar with aphids. Um, they come in a variety of color. Uh, most of the time we see them as green, but you know, we can see them as pink, blue, brown, yellow, black. It just depends. Um, aphids, they reside on new growth. They're attracted to new growth, um, or you can find them on the underside of young leaves. Um, they suck out the plant juices. Uh, they cause deformed, curled growth on new leaves and buds and flowers. And they also excrete honeydew, which is their poo. Now, if um, the plant is small enough, you can take it to the sink or perhaps you can take it outside and spray it with um, a spray of water to remove the aphids. There's no need to use chemicals. Now, scales. Um, there's three main families of scales. Um, there's the armored one. Um, there is the soft 
body and um, also the mealybugs. Now, scales, they suck out plant juices from leaves and stems. They cause stunting, leaf discoloration, and death of the tissue. And as a result of their feeding, um, they also excrete honeydew. Um, honeydew um, offers a growing medium for a fungus called a sooty mold. And when this is present, it can detract from the plant's appearance and it also blocks light from reaching the leaf surface. Scales, the, they're usually undetected until there's a, a time of infestation, uh, when you notice the infestation. And the population at that time is usually very large. Now, mealybugs. Those are uh, soft bodies. Uh, they're covered uh, with white, waxy filaments. Um, it gives them a look of a white, cottony appearance. And um, these insects are frequently found on new growth of the stem and where they suck out the plant juices. Um, it'll cause wilting and um, Sometimes some species of mealybugs first appear on the underside of leaves and mealybugs excrete um, sticky honeydew, which attracts city mold. And again, for these, I would just uh, rinse them with water. And if you're still having uh, problems uh, or you can't take that plant to the sink or outside to spray, then I'll take a cotton swab with um, alcohol and I will remove my mealybugs. Now, spider mites, they're the second most common pest problem on houseplants, and you usually see the webbing first, as you see in the left photo. Um, the spider mites, they thrive in hot and dry conditions. Um, the adult females, they're hardly visible to the unaided my, uh, eye, and mites they feed on the underside of young leaves and the infected areas on this, you're gonna see some grayish or yellowing speckling on those leaves. Now thrips, while they're mostly uncommon on houseplants, you're gonna, they, um, they like to feed on plants in um, patios in other outdoor areas. And they're very small. Um, they're tan, black, brown in color. Uh, they have lighter, uh, lighter markings, they're very small, uh, very hard to see. They, um, the adults and the larvae, they feed on the shoot tips, uh, flowers, and leaves by sucking out the sap and the cell contents. And um, the injured tissue that they have been devouring, it's going to have a whitish or silver flecked appearance. And that's due to the light reflecting from the empty cell walls of the dead cells. Now, leaf spots are most common problem, but they're usually not caused by a disease. Uh, for example, leaf skulls occur when water droplets on the leaves act as a lens and uh, it focuses excessive light in one spot. And it bleaches the chlorophyll and kills the underlying tissue. Now, spots with patterns, now they're signs of a disease. Um, they have a tan center. Um, usually dark or light borders called halos around them. Um, the dark structures, they might be present on the underside. Um, and uh, these are usually a, a spores, which is a dispersal um, of their means. And um, for a disease to happen, we need three factors to be, to be present. We need, number one, a host plant. We need a viable pathogen and we need a, a favorable environment. And because the home has very low relative humidity and water is often applied directly to the growing medium, and by keeping the foliage dry, chances of a foliar disease occurring are minimal. Most importantly, avoid causing stress to your plants because a healthy plant is much more likely to fight off a disease than that of one that is stressed. And the most common causes of stresses in interiors are uh, created by low light and overwatering. 
Now, soil-borne pathogens, they're commonly found on stressed plants and so soil-borne diseases. They're commonly occurring when the growing medium is kept it's excessively moist and the fertility levels are high. And also low light and overwatering creates favorable environments for soil borne disease. So let's go shopping for our plants. Um, we want to purchase healthy looking plants with good leaf color. We want to avoid plants that have yellow or brown leaves. Um, which are unnatural to that specific variety. If the plant's unhealthy at the nursery, chances are it's gonna die when you bring it home. Um, pick it up, examine it, look for pests on the underside of the leaves. Remove the plant from the pot, examine the roots. I know myself, I embarrass my husband when I do this, when we're out in the nursery. I take it out of the pot, I, I examine the roots, and I even like to smell the root ball because I want to smell that wonderful earthy smell. You all know what I'm talking about. You know, all of us gardeners, we just love that earthy smell. Now, healthy roots, they generally are, and they should be uh, visible along the outside of the soil ball. And um, they should have that earthy smell. And any discoloration, uh, generally brown or blackened roots, they're usually a sign of problems. However, some plants, they have roots with colors other than white. So again, you'll want to smell those roots and make sure that it has a good earthy smell to it. Now, if you're shopping for ferns and uh, you're not familiar with ferns, don't be alarmed if you see brown colored spots on low, uh, long rows of sur on the surface structure of a lower leaf. Um, these spots, their reproductive structures, um, they're called spores. And of course, you know, there's some of us, we're just Mother Teresa of plants and we wanna nurse them back to health. And if you're one of us, then of course, go ahead and get it. But when you bring it home, keep it isolated from your other plants until you've nursed it back and it's a healthy plant again. Now, another concern when you're purchasing plant is if you have children or pets inside your home. Uh, poisonous plants can be a concern. Um, make sure on our website uh, that you check out the page that um, we have on poisonous plants, and that will give you a lot of information on these plants. So um, you have a little bit of time, and I have a few of the most popular um, house plants to talk about. Uh, we have the tillandsias. Uh, we all know that we call them air plants. Um, they don't grow any, any soil medium. Um, so that's their very, you see them sometimes in Christmas bulbs, uh, hanging on Christmas trees. It's a wonderful gift to give sometimes at Christmas. Now the aloes, they're, um, they're good indoor plants if you're busy and if, if you have a bright spot in your home. Um, now, not all aloes are medicinal. So the medicinal aloe is the aloe vera. And um, I think most of us that are cooks always have a, a handy aloe vera potted um, nearby if we burn ourselves. Uh, it's a great uh, ointment. Uh, just pull that leaf off the plant and open it up and put it on your burn. African violets, they, they're one of my favorite, um, but they can be finicky. And, uh, but if you know what they like, they can be a very happy house plant. Um, my husband uh, says they're like bunnies. Um, you know, you get a couple and then they keep multiplying. Uh, I just love to propagate either by um, dividing crowns or by uh, leaf propagation. So, um, I hope to be doing a presentation on African violence uh, soon. Um, and if you're on our um, newsletter list, then I will be announcing that. Or you can always check our website as well. Now the anthuriums, um, they're cheerful, they're exotic, uh, they're, they're flowering. They often um, 
have glossy green heart-shaped leaves and they're um, topped by heart-shaped um, blossoms, either pink, red, white, uh, and they're long lasting. Um, now, they'll bloom almost all year long if they get the right amount of light, fertilizer, and moisture. Um, the anthurium, um, it's a natural air purifier. Um, so it's, it's a great plant to have in your, um, and, and beautiful plant to have in your home. The arrowhead plant is an excellent house plant. Um, it, it will tolerate low light. Um, it's been popular for more than 100 years, uh, the arrowhead plant. It's withstood the test of time because it's both attractive and it's very, very easy to grow. The bird of paradise is a stunning tropical plant, um, commonly grown as a house plant throughout the country. But here in our coastal zones, uh, we find it on our, in our landscapes and in, on our patios and our decks as well. The bromeliads, um, they're colorful, they're long lasting blooms. Um, they'll last for weeks. Um, and uh, they, those colors, they contrast beautifully against the strappy green leaves. Um, you'll see them in shades of pink, um, red, orange, and yellow. Um, one little tip that I wanna give you is that after the main flower on your bromeliad has begun to fade, the mother plant will begin to uh, decline, but you'll see a baby, um, they're called pups, and they're going to be developing around the base. So um, let those grow out and enjoy more. Now your Chinese evergreen, it's one of the best plants for beginners or maybe um, us folks that are too busy or, um, or have a difficult time keeping our plants alive. This is a sturdy plant. It's uh, easy to grow. It tolerates just about every indoor condition. And it's one of the toughest plants, and it's also very beautiful. Um, most varieties, they have rich green leaves. Um, they're attractive patterns uh, with some silver on them. Um, also, they have a cute calla lily-like bloom in spots um, where you plant them when they get enough light, uh, but you have to provide the light for them to bloom. Now, the Christmas or uh, Thanksgiving cactus is one of the most colorful flowering house plants. Um, this easy care grower, it bursts into bloom when the days get short and it puts on a fabulous show during the holiday season. Um, you can find uh, the cactus in a wide variety of colors, um, pink, red, scarlet, orange, gold, cream, white, um, as well as bicolor. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a cinch to grow. It, it's made it popular holiday plant for uh, giving as gifts for generations. Now the corn plant, it's sometimes called the mass cane. It's easy to grow. It makes it one of the best house plants for beginners. Um, the corn plant, it bears a thick woody trunk uh, topped by clusters of strappy uh, dark green leaves highlighted by a lime green stripe down the center. Um, in situations where when it's really happy, it will bloom. It'll produce clusters of fragrant creamy white flowers. However, it doesn't bloom in most homes because it prefers more light to bear um, than most homes will give. Now your croton, it's one of the boldest house plants around and you can't miss them because of their colorful foliage. Um, grow them in a bright spot. Um, they like tons of light to produce all of these colorful leaves. And in fact, if your plant um, doesn't get enough light, you're gonna lose the color in those leaves and um, it's gonna go, grow tall and lank, lanky and um, you won't have those beautiful leaf colors. Now, despite its common name, the devil's backbone, also called the zigzag plant, um, if you have a bright spot, is a wonderful, easy to grow house plant. It purifies the air and it adds a lot of drama to indoor decor. 
it holds up to dry conditions well, so it's going to survive if you forget to water it every now and again. Um, or if you go on vacation and travel um, for a few days or you have a busy schedule, it's pretty forgiving. Um, it's one of the easiest house plants when it comes to humidity. Uh, low humidity is fine. Um, as well as average and high humidity. So it's not, it's not picky. The Diffenbachia uh, is one of the easiest indoor house plants and one of the most common indoor house plants. Um, it's a tropical shrub. It shows off its lush leaves, um, usually marked with shades of cream, yellow or white. Um, it's usually a top pick for brightening up uh, dim corners of of indoors. Um, they add a lot of fun and color and texture without flowers. Um, however, keep in mind, different block is, they, they might be poisonous, um, depending on the variety, and um, you want to keep them out of your reach of your children and your pets. Now the elephant ears, they're stunning house plants. Um, they often feature dark shield-shaped foliage um, they may be accentuated by white veins running through the leaves. Um, occasionally, they're going to flower. Um, they're going to send up a spike-like, calla-like white uh, or maybe yellow or cream bloom. But the reason that we love it is because of its foliage. It's just a stunning plant. Um, it's a perfect plant for high humidity areas, such as your bathrooms and your kitchens. Now we all love ferns, um, and ferns are the most beautiful house plants. Um, they, their love of moist air makes them perfect for um, bright bathrooms or kitchens. And if they don't get enough humidity, their fronds, they're going to, we're going to get some necrosis on those tips and leaf margins. And um, they're going to dry out uh, prematurely. So make sure that they have um, the humidity that they, they desire. Now ficus, we also call them figs, and they're, they're among the most popular indoor plants and for good reasons, because they're easy to grow house plants. And they offer a lot of variety from low ground cover types to tall trees. Uh, ficus also offers a variety of textures, so there's one for practically everyone's personal style. Now, while ficuses are easy to grow, the weeping ficus, it particularly has a reputation for dropping its leaves. Um, they don't like to have uh, their location change, so when you bring it home, make sure that you put it in the spot it's going to be happy in and it's going to live in because every time you move that ficus, it's going to tell you it's unhappy and it's going to drop its leaves. Now keep your fiddle leaf fig happy by growing it in a bright spot. And the more light it gets, the faster it's going to grow and the better it's going to look. And unfortunately, this house plant, it's not a good choice for low light spots. So make sure you use that light meter to make sure that you're going to put it where it's going to be happy. Ivy is one of the most common house plants around. It's a classic favorite. It's been loved for generations. Um, however, we, we tend not to want to put it outside anymore because of it being uh, invasive. So what I like to do for my ivies is I grow them as topiaries. Um, you can also hang them in baskets. Um, they're they're a, a great, and you know, as you see, uh, the light levels um, are high, low, and medium. Now the Madagascar dragon tree, it's one of the most popular house plants around. It, um, it bears um, narrow green leaves. It's banded in red or pink on the top of slender stems. Um, it's upright habit and uh, has an upright habit, as you can see in the picture. And if you want to prune your Madagascar dragon tree, you can cut the top of it off and it's going to sprout new branches. And if you pot the part that you cut off in moist potting mix, it may root 
and it may grow another plant for you. Now, maidenhair vine, it's a stunning house plant. It creates a carpet of small, shiny, dark leaves, and it's excellent for creating a ground cover effect under taller plants. Now make sure that when you're combining plants that in the same container, that they, they have the same light, water, soil, and fertilizer requirements. You don't wanna mix these requirements. Um, you wanna make sure that they are all uh, liking the same um, cultural care. Now, who doesn't love orchids? Um, this happens to be a dendrobium and a phalaenopsis, and I'm hoping uh, that I can talk one of our master gardeners who um, is our uh, orchid expert into giving a future presentation just on orchids. The oyster plant is sometimes called Moses in the cradle. It's exceptionally easy to grow, um, and it's popular indoors and out. And as a house plant, it's loved for its no fuss nature. Um, it's one of the house plant that basically just needs regular water to look fantastic. So it's a great plant for those starting out or who've had problems um, with their house plants. Now, palms um, are perfect for adding bold tropical touch to our homes and. There's a variety of beautiful palm trees that thrive as houseplants in our bright rooms. The peace lily is a, a common houseplant. It bears dark green leaves and charming white calla-like flowers on tall stems. Um, and when in bloom, the plant looks best when it's grouped in clusters of three or more. Peperomias. They're delightful. They're easy to grow. Um, they've been around for years and they're still popular. And, um, and they're, they're easy to grow. Uh, it's one of the smaller house plants. And uh, so you don't need a lot of room to grow these. Now your philodendron, it's a classic and it's practically a no fail house plant because it's so easy to grow. Um, it, it's pretty common indoor plant to find at your local garden center as well. And um, the philodendron family, it's, it's a pretty big one. So you can find a variety of plants that grow in um, different ranges of shapes, sizes, and colors. Your ponytail palm, its best quality is um, how easy it is to grow. And as long as you don't overwater it, the plant may seem virtually indestructible. Pothos, uh, it's a perfect house plant for beginners. Uh, it's one of the easiest you can grow and one of the most popular. Aglaonema, um, it's one of those easy house plants to grow. Um, the red Aglaonema is one of the most stylish. Uh, this happens to be one of my favorite. Um, I have several of these in my home because as you can see, <clears throat> they, um, they will tolerate just about all um, light except direct sunlight. They're elegant and um, they're, they're a beautiful, beautiful color. The sago palm, um, it's one of the easiest house plants you can grow. Um, it's, it's a living fossil, if you didn't know that, uh, dating back to prehistoric times. Um, so if it's survived all of these years, no wonder it's easy to grow in our homes, but um, they're very poisonous. So please, please um, be careful when you have these in your homes with children and pets. Now, if you're looking for an easy to care house plant, you can't do much better than the snake plant. And um, it's hardy, it's uh, very popular. It's been popular for generations. Um, they, um, they have stiff, upright, sword-like leaves, and um, they come in a variety of colors. And you don't prune these. And the spider plant, also called the airplane plant, um, it's a house plant that withstood the test of time. And as popular today as it was generations ago, um, there 
easy to grow. Um, they thrive in bright light, but they're going to tolerate some low light too. Um, and it doesn't mind being watered frequently, but it can go a while without water and it still will look good. Now succulents, they're some of the trendiest plants around today and um, you'll often see them featured in magazines and blogs and everywhere, um, including um, Pinterest and no wonder, um, they, they come in a variety of, of color um, and shapes. Um, but not all succulents grow well inside. So when you are choosing succulents, please make sure you choose the varieties that are going to grow inside your home. And the number one problem that we have with um, succulents are uh, two things. Um, they need to be potted in, into a cacti mix. So um, they need that sandy um, soil. And also, um, we have a tendency to want to overwater them. So um, take care and uh, don't overwater them. Uh, overwater them. Now your Thai plant, it's a bold house plant with flamboyant colored uh, foliage. Um, most varieties, they have purple foliage, uh, purple foliage but um, You'll find them also with a variegation of uh, hot pink, cream, white, or other shades of purple. Um, they, they're also associated with uh, good luck. Now your yucca cane is an old fashioned house plant. It's, it's common now as it was generation ago. And um, the yucca cane is, it's wonderfully easy to grow. It's an excellent choice if you're just starting out with house plants. Um, and your ZZ plant, this is our last plant, it's easy to grow too. Um, it's uh, just was started being introduced in the uh, 1990s and so um, it's a little more difficult to find in your um, in your nurseries because um, it is slow get taking off. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Maria. Maria? Let's get that going. I'm sorry I wasn't on there. There we are. Um, Thank you, Sheridan. That was a wonderful amount of information. And um, for more of that information, you can certainly direct your questions to us uh, right now. We can only take a few, um, but you, any question that comes through, we'll try to answer via email. Um, one of the, while you're generating your questions, let's talk about some of the resources that are available to you. Some of you asked questions about identifying plants and, and such things. All these resources, plus the Master Gardener uh, information uh, website, will help you submit a picture of some of the plants that you have, and we might be able to identify them for you. Um, we also have a wonderful uh, pest um, site for identifying um, home and garden turf and landscape pests that you can also get on our site, and we highly recommend that as well. So with any home gardening question, just contact us as master gardeners and we'll do our very best to uh, collectively put our heads together and get an answer for you. Now, uh, let's go to a couple of questions before we, um, uh, our time is over. Um, one of the questions that came up in a number of different ways was, are there ways that we can affect the light in our house? especially in a north window, and whether or not our windows themselves affect the light. Uh, some of the e-glass windows and things like that, Sherida. Yeah, so uh, not only do we have uh, the light quantity, but the quality. Um, and again, um, I just want to um, have you search out those apps for light meters. Um, the um, the tinting, window tinting, the, the film that you put on windows will affect, but if you use your light meter, um, you will see that um, 
the, the reading on that and know what you can, um, what plants you can place in that light requirement. And also, um, you know, sometimes shears over uh, windows will um, take away from the light coming into the room. And as we talked earlier as well, the um, different times of the seasons affect the light. Um, so you're just gonna have to play around with it. Um, every house is different um, and every lighting situation is different. And um, just get to know your, um, your lighting inside your house, just as we do when we're doing our landscaping outside. And when we call it the right plant for the right place. How effective are grow lights and things like that? Um, is that pushing the limits in terms of uh, fussing with the situation? if we add grow lights to some of our, for some of our house plants? Well, that's certainly up to your choice. Yes, grow lights are, um, they do help um, in low light conditions. It's just a matter of, you know, how, what your aesthetics are inside your home. And if you um, want to have grow lights in your home um, to help with the lights, that, then certainly do that. Okay. Um, now, in terms of uh, some of the problems with white flies um, and root gnats, um, do you have any uh, quick suggestions in terms of how to address those issues with houseplants? Well, that's caused by overwatering. <laughs> so you can address that you by not overwatering your plants. <laughs> does drying the plants out help a little bit? Yes, it does. After you observe that, great. Um, is there a, a good substitution for uh, bleach uh, when it's not available for sterilizing your pots and things like that? Are there any other products that might be useful? Um, I have never used any. I've only Anything used else? bleach, yeah. So um, with okay. that, I see that we're basically out of time, so. Um. Yes, we are, yes we are. So re remember everyone that uh, you're welcome to uh, send in your questions and contact us in the future. We will be in contact with you as a follow-up to this lecture with some um, other answers and questions and also some other resources available. So uh, um, thank you, Sherida. That was a wonderful presentation and we have very much enjoyed being with you today. And thank you, everybody. I really enjoyed this. Thank you.